Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Once part of the ATA tribe, you'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Sean Will. Sean received his MS from the University of North Texas within the Applied Behavior Analysis Program and completed an internship at Harvard Medical School's Department of Psychiatry. Currently, Sean is a researcher in Florida Tech's PhD program, conducting research on learning and problem solving. Sean spearheaded the development of constructional affection a new procedure for training dogs that meets training goals without the use of food, rewards, or force. Sean founded the Give Them Love Animal Shelter in 2012, which is a not-profit that works to enhance the lives of animals in shelters. He has over 12 years' experience as a professional dog trainer, working with dogs and their caretakers to address problems with aggression, hyperactivity, socialization, separation anxiety, basic obedience, and quality of life. He's conducted research, developed programs used at animal shelters, zoos, and public schools schools, looking into questions of performance improvement, instructional design, quality of life, and the development of problem-solving and critical thinking repertoires. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one, Sean Well, to the ATA Podcast Show today. Sean, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Let's dive straight into the first question today, Sean. For everyone listening, could you please take them back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and share some stories from this time? Yeah, um, it actually starts with the first dog that I ever really had on my own. When I moved out of my mom and dad's house, I got a, a Labrador Retriever. And, uh, you know, thought it was going to be smooth and perfect and easy. And I ended up realizing that there were all sorts of challenges that I wasn't ready for. And um, I actually went to a training center to learn how to train him. And they used this um, mixed method approach. You know, this was, you know, in the early 2000s, probably. And um, they put, you know, a, a slip collar on him. And whenever he would pull or do something undesired, they would, you know, pull on that collar. And then when he would stop pulling, they would click and give him a treat. And um, on the very first pull that he got, um, he actually arched his back and just, you know, peed all over the floor. He, he was terrified. He really didn't like that experience. And so I stopped the training right there and, you know, demanded a refund and, and quit going. But I was still left with my dog that was doing the bad things that he was doing. Mainly in this case, he was barking a lot. You know, he was being rambunctious, chewing up my furniture, tearing up anything he could get his mouth around. He had actually eaten. I had a wooden dresser and uh, the drawer that you pull out. He had literally ate like a corner off of the dresser, like over the middle of the night while I was sleeping one night. I woke up and there was just wood all over the floor. (laughs) Um, And so I still needed help with these problems. And um, I ended up uh, finding an animal trainer who was nearby me in Collin County. His name's Richard Barbie. I think he still does uh, some animal training down in the in the Houston or Austin, Texas area. 
And um, I ended up uh, working with him for, you know, maybe one or two years, just kind of shadowing him, you know, not getting paid, (laughs) Um, just shadowing him and watching him conduct his classes and private lessons. And he would let me help out and teach him. And funny thing right here is um, Richard just happened to be one of the trainers that Kelly Snyder was working with when she was doing her work on constructional aggression treatment. And uh, so I was learning about that from Richard. And after a few years, when he had even helped me open up my own business and I was going back to school, he had highly recommended that I go visit University of North Texas and see the student organization called ORCA. It's the Organization for Reinforcement Contingencies with Animals. Amazing place. If there's any of your listeners out there that want to find, you know, the ideal community to put yourself in to learn more about training and really get to get close with some of the great minds in our field, Orca is the place to be. And um, so, you know, I was real lucky to find that going on in the backyard of the city that I grew up in. (laughs) And, um, you know, I, I went into that program and started to learn more about training at this point. And that was really why I wanted to be there. Um, You know, I felt like I had learned a lot about running a dog training business and, you know, meeting goals with the tools that I had. But um, there were certain instances where, you know, I just didn't feel like I, I knew it all. And there were constantly, you know, dogs that I would meet that, you know, I just couldn't figure out, you know, the quickest way to, to help them. And um, when I got into Orca, I realized that there was no partnership with our local animal shelter. And that was always an area that was really interested, interesting to me. I've always wanted to kind of be in animal shelters and help. And so uh, I went out there and started volunteering at our local animal shelter. And this is where, like, to me, I consider, like, a lot of my, my graduate knowledge and animal training, it, it happened inside that shelter. Um, you know, working with those animals and, you know, paying close attention to what's going on can really teach you a lot about learning and teaching and working with animals. And um, while there, you know, uh, there was a volunteer that that was really doing a lot of the work there. And when she had finished her time at the shelter, the the shelter was looking for a new a new kind of way to start operating. And so they had reached out to myself and Chase Owens, who was also in Orca with me and asked us to help develop a program that would improve their shelter efficiency and get the volunteers and staff all working on the same page. And while there, we um, we would run into these dogs that just didn't want our food treats. We would be clicking and giving them a treat and they would, you know, just, you know, spit it out and keep jumping on us. <laughs> and um, we would get through a training session and, you know, you would look on the floor and all of your treats that you had made and given the dog would be all over the floor around you and the dog was still, you know, jumping on us. <laughs> and... Um, I remember talking to Jesus. Um, I I took a video of this training because we had permission from the shelter to record all of our training sessions. And so I took the video to Jesus, my instructor, and I showed it to him. I was like, Jesus, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here. I said, these dogs, you know, this dog may only have three, four more days in the shelter left of time. And, you know, this is how my training sessions are going. And, um, we ended up having a discussion about that. And Jesus asked me, he was like, well, what rule is there that tells you that you can't get a dog trained that fast? <laughs> and he said that, he said, Sean, the, the organisms are always talking to you. He says, it's your job to step back and listen to them and hear what they're saying. And um, I remember simultaneous with this situation going on, Chase and I were talking about these specific dogs that we would meet on our private dog training practices. And we would meet dogs, too, out in those situations where we couldn't get our food treats to be effective. And sometimes we would, you know, we would have to carry like trump cards with us, you know, on these training visits, like a cooler full of like leftover roast beef from the other night. And even that would only be effective, you know, for short periods of time. And it always kind of left the owners in a funny spot because whenever I would leave, they wouldn't, you know, have the resources available or, or maybe even the desire to go chop up some steak, you know, for their dog to get a training session completed. And he and I would sit around and talk, you know, what are we going to do with these kinds of situations? And um, through that discussion, you know, we were both thinking, well, hey, if they're jumping on us, you know, and they're not taking the food, there's a good chance that it just might be our attention that they're wanting. 
And uh, we asked ourselves the question, you know, what would that look like? How would delivering attention to the dog, you know, really um, function as a reinforcer to shape behavior? And we started thinking, well, you know, if we pet the dog while all four feet are on the ground and if the dog jumps on us, we stop petting. When the dog's feet return back to the floor and we start petting, you know, that would likely increase the likelihood that the dog would stay on the ground. That would be using affection as a reinforcer to maintain standing calmly on the ground. And it was here that we started laying out a lot of the procedures now of how this would look for sitting. Would we be petting for not barking, which is an interesting topic um, because we never go about this in a reductionistic fashion. You don't always have to eliminate behaviors, especially problem behaviors, for learning to take place. Um, This is actually even perhaps an empirical question. I haven't seen a lot of research on this, but anecdotally, I would have to say that no, we don't always have to eliminate problem behavior for learning to occur. Um, In the animal shelter, we never targeted not barking, like I was just mentioning. We would only target, you know, having all four feet on the ground or sitting and lying down next to us. And as an outcome of petting these behaviors and these types of interactions, these other problem behaviors disappear. And it's because those problem behaviors are there to actually obtain the reinforcer, in this case, our affection. And if we're providing that affection for easier to do behaviors that are more desirable for us, the animal will quickly start to allocate their behaviors towards these easier things to do. We have to keep in mind that jumping and nipping and barking and being frantic are really, really costly behaviors for the for our dogs to engage in. And if they can realize or be shown that just sitting here and hanging out gets the same outcomes, they'll likely end up just sitting there and hanging out with you, which is where constructional affection was born. And, um, This to me gets back to that point, you know, your question about my path on positive reinforcement. Um, You know, the the consequence that we're providing here, um, when I give lectures and talks and workshops and things on constructional affection, oftentimes a question comes up, well, where does food come into this picture? And food does play a role, but not directly in this situation, because what the animal wants is our affection. If we're to keep trying to force food on them and, you know, up the quality of that reinforcer, so to say, getting steak or chicken or these other things, we're actually just adding in a competing contingency rather than dealing with the contingency that's actually present. So what it is, is that the dog wants our affection in this situation. So now they're being given an option when we have food. I can, uh, I can sit here and get the food or I can jump on you and continue to get the affection. And so now whenever that food isn't wanted or whenever the getting attention from the person is more valuable than the food, we're going to see that old behavior come back because we've never actually addressed it. And on the other hand, if we were to actually teach them, this is how you behave to get our affection, we've actually directly dealt with that contingency that's active in that moment, which is getting the affection and we're getting to the root of the problem by teaching them a different way to obtain it. And this to me is kind of the essence of a constructional approach to animal training. In the constructional approach, we like to ensure that we're using the reinforcers that are maintaining the the problem behavior in the first place. And so, for example, if we're out on a leash walk and a dog is pulling to get to some spot that they want to sniff or, you know, lick or bite or whatever it is that they want to do with this thing out here. um, If we wait till they're not pulling and we click and give them a treat, we're actually not dealing with the contingency of how the dog should behave when there's something that they want to get to. And so when we're clicking and treating, we're providing that competing contingency. You can pull and get towards that thing, or you can orient towards me and I can click and treat. And taking a constructional approach might look something more like what Kay Lawrence does in a lot of her training. I believe she calls it the stop and go method. And that's where if the dog is pulling, we don't pull back. You know, we stop and we wait and we'll wait till the animal orients towards us. And then we'll allow the animal to walk towards that thing that they want to get to. We don't have a problem that they want to go sniff something, but we want them to know not to pull us to get there to go towards that thing. And this kind of gets to that idea, too, of a mutually reinforcing experience. When we're out walking with our dogs, we should be out in the world exploring it together. You know, you and I out walking around, having a good time. 
And just like if we were out walking with a kid, if a kid saw a flower that they wanted to check out, we would, you know, pull them back towards us and demand that they stay at our side. We would let them check out that thing and then we would say, okay, let's move on together. And I recommend doing the same thing with the dog. If there's something that they want to pull over and sniff, we should let them do it, but we should teach them how to do it. And that's the same philosophy with the affection. It's not a problem that they want it, but perhaps the way that they're going about it creates problems. So we teach them how to ask for it. So do you do you see it as a, I want to use the word problem, challenge? Um, I don't know. There's a better word here, but it's not coming to me quickly. So let's just move on. Do you see it as a problem that people want to just reach for the food pouch so quickly? Um, what, what, do you, what do you think? I can see no one can see Sean vigorously shaking his head, but that's what he's doing right now. No, shaking his head in a no. Um, I'm not saying that, Ryan. Um, do, do you do you feel that some trainers have a reliance on food, and, and therefore they're not they're not seeking out different functions for their learners? Well, you, I'm I'm really slow to to say that any method is good or bad or better or worse. Um, these are all, you know, different tools that all come in handy and have applications in, in different areas and are sometimes more helpful than others in different circumstances. And I grew up as a clicker trainer and, and I love clicker training and I still use it. Um, but I just see constructional affection as filling a specific niche, especially when it comes to behaviors that are more aligned with our day to day life and how we're living with our animals. Really, the things that we might consider as like basic obedience, I see is being really, really um, conducive to taking a constructional affection approach to. But definitely when we're teaching complex behaviors and highly advanced repertoires, a clicker and a precise marker, like what you get when you do clicker training, is, is very necessary. But I, I wouldn't say that, that people are too quick to go to food. Um, food is, is a wonderful thing, and it can be a, a wonderful asset, especially in you know, providing a good thing that they love to them. That's a, that's a great thing. But I do think that sometimes we undervalue the impact that our attention and affection can have on a dog. And um, I think sometimes our world can get us so busy and so hung up on carrying out our day-to-day -day duties that sometimes our affection gets accidentally misplaced and misused. And um, an example that I like to talk to people about is um, when we, when our dogs are behaving and being really, being really calm and really good and just kind of hanging out, it really frees us up to, you know, take care of our kids, help them with their homework, clean up our house, you know, prepare dinner, get our notes together for our episode the next day for our podcast. It frees us up to do our jobs that we need to do. And so oftentimes that leaves the dog being unreinforced in these moments. And so whenever they don't get attention for those things and they want our attention, you'll see that they'll often find other ways to go about getting it than being calm. And that might be picking up your favorite pair of slippers and taking off with them down the hallway or snatching the remote control to the TV or any number of other things that demands our attention and even extreme things. Um, and there was a, a couple of unique situations that I found myself dealing with um, around this time that I was doing the work in the animal shelter. And it was funny that they happened so close. It was really unusual. I got them like within a couple of weeks of each other, these two specific dogs. And what they would do is they would bark at people when people would come up. It wasn't aggressive barking. You know, it was playful, kind of high pitched, you know, yapping. And these were Labradors. But whenever they didn't get access to that thing, if, if they were barking at me and I stood still, they would actually sometimes start biting at their, their human, their person, the person holding the leash. They would start barking and turning around and nipping, you know, at their legs and their pants and at their hands and things like that. And so they had actually learned a really, really extreme way to get that attention that they really, really wanted. And then it was by getting those getting those nips because how are you going to ignore that you know <laughs> and then even sometimes when we step back and move away you know out of the way that can be enough of a game to actually keep that behavior going and so we have to be really careful with situations like that and um, what I ended up having to do is actually remove the person from that situation teach the dog how to get me to come on their own and then reintroduce the person but we can talk more procedural things you know a little bit later but um Back to answering your question directly, um, you know, I, I don't think that it is that people are reaching for food too fast. 
um, I do think that sometimes we can get some help and, you know, practice providing the affection in these specific patterns and ways to kind of help produce outcomes. And that can also enhance our desired outcomes when we're using food later. And um, real quick, this might be a good time for me to tell you how to do constructional affection or at least the, the, the guidelines for it. Um, we got a heck of a tropical storm moving through here right now, man. Can you hear this? <laughs> yeah, I heard some. Was that thunder? <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> I thought it was a dog smashing something in the background. <laughs> Yeah, my boy's being pretty good. He's he's a he's an he's an old timer, so he's been through a few storms. He was also a, a wild dog. I don't know if I told you about Peepers before. He was a wild dog caught out in the forests in North Texas with a pack of four or five other dogs. And uh, he was about a year old when they caught him and brought him into the animal shelter. And uh, he was as gre- as aggressive and nasty as you can imagine when I got him. Uh, he was really, really, really mean to people, like really aggressive. He would attack people trying to get near him. And same thing with other dogs. And, uh, and that was actually why I adopted him from the shelter. The shelter was really full. It was around July or August, I think, right around the 4th of July when shelters get ridiculously overcrowded. And uh, Peepers was out of time. And so I went ahead and adopted him and brought him home. And He's actually a living, breathing example of, you know, what constructional aggression treatment and constructional affection can get you. Um, but I was about to explain the, uh, you know, the procedure of constructional affection and tie it into this other story for a moment. And um, the, the constructional affection actually consists of, of two phases. The, the first one is the interaction guidelines. And the interaction guidelines teach our dogs how to ask for and receive our affection. So we have to keep in mind that a prerequisite to do constructional affection is that our dogs are approaching us seeking our affection. If they are scared of us, if they are fearful, if they're behaving timid, or if they're aggressive, we do not use constructional affection with them. Um, One primary thing is that I like to tell everybody, you know, we are not here to force ourselves on our dogs. We're not going to chase them down. We're not going to leash them and keep them close to us. You know, this is a voluntary process. I, I want the dogs approaching us. And if they're not approaching, I highly recommend doing constructional aggression treatment. Um, To me, these two procedures are opposite sides of the same coin. The goal of constructional aggression treatment is to get an approach, not to be able to get close to the dog and touch it. That's not the goal of CAT. The goal of CAT is to get the dog to approach you, call me. And so once when we have that approach, you know, what we want to do then is constructional affection and teach them how to ask for that affection and receive it that now they're asking for. And then the second step of constructional affection is the affection loop. And the goal of the affection loop is to take this calm behavior that we've established through the interaction guidelines and to extend it to other situations that are important to us. And um, in the animal shelters, some of those were, you know, providing vaccinations. We would get the dog really calm, do the interaction guidelines with them. Then we would establish a short affection loop where we're petting our dogs and just taking our hands off for a second and coming back to them and petting them as long as they're hanging out there, still being still, still being calm, all four feet on the ground. And what we do is slowly extend the time that our hands are off until we can take our hands off and grab the syringe and present it to them, put it down, love them up a little bit more, take our hands off, maybe touch them with the syringe, put it down, keep them calm. And we would practice that loop until we can actually pet the dog, give the injection, put it down and level them up some more and have it be as, as, you know, positive an experience as it can possibly be. And um, other situations that we built up the affection loop to where we, uh, we trained all the dogs in our shelter, what we called kennel behaviors. And a kennel behavior is just how the dog should behave while inside their enclosures. And we would want to make sure that we were inserting things into our affection loop that were important to the, the animal shelter itself. And so this might be how the dog should behave when we're entering and exiting the enclosure to change their food or to change their bedding or to leash them up and take them on a walk. And we would train up all of these behaviors using the affection loop. And so to uh, do the food bowl, for example, we might get the dog sitting and laying down inside their enclosure, petting them up, take our hands off, maybe play with the door to the enclosure, go back to them, pet them again, 
and maybe get up, open and close the latch a little bit, pedal them again, get up, leave the enclosure, come back in, pedal, and insert different activities into that process that would resemble closely what it is that they're going to be experiencing in their daily life. And this kind of gets to the point of how these things are maintained and why I would encourage a strong consideration of using affection for moments like these over food in this case. Um, not in all cases, in, in these ones, I would, I would deem it more valuable. And um, it's because we're using the consequence that's going to be available in their daily life. So this means we don't need to actually introduce any kind of fading procedure or anything like that because we're actually training in the natural contingency that the dog's experiencing in their daily life. And in their daily life, it will also be maintained through affection so we don't have to fade things out to different reinforcers. And uh, the way that we maintained this in the animal shelter was with a little sticker. Once the dogs had learned their kennel behaviors, they would receive a special sticker on the outside of their enclosure. And at this point, we had trained all of the staff and volunteers in the animal shelter, and they knew to look out for these stickers. Because if an enclosure had that, they knew that if they were going by the enclosure and the dog was hanging out, sitting or laying down, to just go in there real quick, give them a rub on the head, say, good boy, good girl, and then leave the enclosure. And just these few things going on through the day would be enough to shape that up to be a pretty solid behavior inside the dog's repertoire. And this would be really important for when a potential adopter was coming in because they would walk up to the enclosure and see the dog sitting there being calm, waiting politely to greet them. And people see that and they love it. You know, they really want that. And they think that that's a sweet, polite, wonderful dog that they want to take home. No one really goes to the animal shelter looking to adopt a bundle of problems and a super hyperactive, hard to deal with and hard to train dog. And so we wanted to make sure that we trained these behaviors because they are pretty universally accepted as desirable behaviors um, by us. And it's something easy that they can do that's in every dog's repertoire. Every single dog out there can sit and lay down or stand on all four feet. And so that makes it a really easy thing to capture and shape up. Um, in these examples where we have a dog that's nipping us, um, like with the example I was giving you earlier, one of the things that we can actually do is provide that affection before that nipping ever happens. So as that dog is standing there on all four feet and I'm approaching it, I go ahead and, you know, show that cue that I'm coming to give them affection, my hands. And that'll actually stop it from escalating and going to that higher point because the dogs are already receiving the cue that they're getting that outcome that's desirable. And so doing this um, kind of allows us a little bit of freedom in our training to get things done in a manner where we are not required to teach our clients or to teach the adopters in this case a complex fading procedure or training program in order to take these behaviors home with them. Because these behaviors, the cues become us. You know, a person becomes the cue to sit or lay down or behave calmly in order to receive our affection. And so it really does provide the foundation for the dog to immediately start building the kinds of relationships that are really good for them and their new family. And when you say complex fading procedure, can you define that for us? Sure. Um, you know, Bob Bailey is one of my favorite trainers in the whole world. And um, he used to have a saying right before he ever talked about clicker training. And he used to say it's a complex process. It's a technical skill. And to do clicker training effectively, it really takes a whole lot of repertoires for somebody. They not only have to have the conditioned seeing to see the behaviors that they're looking for, but they also have to have the timing with the click. They also have to have the, the, the mechanical repertoire to get that click and deliver that treat effectively. These are not really easy skills to learn. And even those of us that go out and do clicker training as our, as our careers, you know, it is a complex skill that we spent often years ourselves developing. And so it is a hard thing sometimes to impart to somebody in a four or five week group class or in a fleeting moment getting to visit with somebody in an animal shelter before they adopt a, adopt a new family member. And so you, firstly, if, if a dog's showing fearful signs or aggressive signs and this, this, you don't go straight in with a construction or affection, as you mentioned, and is this something within the shelter and your experience there um, with the sticker system and getting dogs 
uh, ready for adoption, something that you applied with all, all of the dogs, or is there some dogs that this was not suitable for? And what, uh, like general criteria, <laughs> if that's a way of asking this question, uh, might have been ones that you looked for to decide that hey, this dog isn't a candidate for this. Yeah, um, in our shelter program. Every single dog that came into the shelter, uh, we provided a temperament assessment for them. And during that temperament assessment, if we saw any fearful, shy, or timid behavior or aggression, we would immediately start doing constructional aggression treatment with them. And when doing constructional aggression treatment, you'll often find that there's a number of triggers for the aggression. You know, very, very rarely is it ever just, you know, a, you know, an easy one and go, you know, I go there and the dog's friendly with me and then bam, the whole world's changed. Usually it's multiple people, sometimes uh, bringing in a leash or holding a food bowl or making noises, different things will identify as triggers. And so we'll continue to identify those triggers while we're doing constructional aggression treatment um, for the aggression or fearful behavior. And we will come back and do that temperament assessment over and over until we see that we've covered all of the triggers that we can possibly come up with. And we can say that this is a friendly dog. And we don't just say friendly dog subjectively. We, we really looked for outright friendly behaviors before we risked an interaction with them. Um, you know, in all the years I've done constructional aggression treatment, it's been about 12, maybe more now. Um, I've never been bit. And it's because I never, ever force myself on a dog and I never, ever, ever go to pet them unless I'm certain of how that outcome is going to be. And so in the animal shelter, we would keep doing the cat procedure until that dog is essentially begging for our attention and crying and pleading for us to come to them. <laughs> we really want to see some overt behavior indicating that this dog is ready to be touched. And, um, and, 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 you know, that's maybe a talk for a different time, you know, about the switchover. There, there's actually some specific procedures that we go through when doing the switchover. And um, I'm not sure how recently you've had um, Jesus Rosales Ruiz on, um, but, but there's been some pretty awesome revisions in the CAT procedure, and it might be a great time to have him back on to talk about that. Um, but so we would then at that point do constructional affection. And, and like I mentioned earlier, the prerequisite for that behavior is that the dog has to be approaching us. They need to be approaching us, seeking our affection. And um, now sometimes they might be approaching us, but then when we go to pet them, you might see a different reaction. And um, there's a story I'm going to go ahead and share with you real quick. I think I hope we have time for it. Um, cool. <laughs> is uh, Big Mike. And uh, Big Mike was this really, really, really a aggressive, um, some kind of poodle terrier mix, I'm going to guess. He was a really small, white, fluffy um, little fella. And the shelter staff at this point in the animal shelter, I was just beginning to implement our program and we were just getting into constructional aggression treatment where I was training the staff how to identify the dogs and do the procedure. And they were very skeptical that we had an effective procedure that would work quickly for them. And so they were really, really excited when they found Big Mike because they put him aside in an enclosure waiting specifically for me because they were like, there's no way Sean's going to be able to help this dog. <laughs> and, um, and it was really vicious. If the dog was bigger, this would have been a gigantic problem. But if you set foot inside this dog's enclosure, he came at you viciously. He was a small dog, but it was very, very, very aggressive behavior. And he would rip up the shoes, your, your pants. If he could get to your ankles, he, he would have broken skin, I'm sure. Um, little guy, but very aggressive. And I did constructional aggression treatment with him and got him where he was very happily and calmly walking right up to me and even kind of leaning up against me, just kind of laying on me a little bit. And whenever I would go to pet him, he would tighten up real bad and, you know, start to flinch. And it was obvious he was not ready to be touched. And typically in that situation, I would start to do cat with my hand to see if, you know, maybe there's a history with the hand, which is very likely with some dogs. If a dog has been abused or hit frequently, um, I call that abuse too, um, there's going to be a very strong likelihood that they're going to be averse to hands. And perhaps when you go to pet them, they might flinch because they don't know what to expect. 
And so I typically would have started doing that, but I could notice when I got close to Big Mike that his skin had tears all over it. And his hair was, you know, because he had been out for who knows how long, you know, on his own. And his hair was so matted up and pulled so tight that it was literally tearing the skin along the sides of the bunches of matted hair. And so it wasn't really that he was scared of my hand, is that his whole body was hurting and he didn't want to be touched. He was happy being close to me, but didn't want to be touched. Um, because I'd gotten him so close to me, I then did construction aggression treatment with their trimmers, where I'd bring the trimmers close, very similarly to how I explained earlier with the syringe. And that allowed me the opportunity to start trimming out these big chunks of matted hair. I was able to shave them down and give him a bath. And the um, funny thing is that we realized at that point that, that Big Mike was a girl. <laughs> and so we ended up changing our name to Fluffy. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was, you know, these are things that we want to look out for before doing constructional affection. We definitely want to make sure that they're approaching us. We definitely want to make sure that they're not still terrified of our hands. If you're still seeing some aversive reactions, but then also look out for medical conditions. It doesn't just have to be matted hair that creates an aversion to touch. It can be rashes. It can be mange. It can be all sorts of other, um, skin you know, issues or medical issues that could be making touch a painful experience. And so never rule that out too. You might want to check those things out if we're still seeing a dog that is really averse to, to our touch. Um, one other last point I want to throw in here is you mentioned, did I do this with all the dogs? And, and yes, I did. Um, Chase and I would often go in to the animal shelter together and the animal shelter layout was in a big U. And there were several enclosures along the wall, the entire wall in this U shape. And Chase and I would go in for about two, maybe three hours. And we would start at opposite ends of the, of the shelter. And we would go through every single one of the enclosures providing constructional aggression treatment or constructional affection to the dogs. And um, yeah, we would typically get it done with every single dog in there. And I, I got some really cool video, as a matter of fact, where you'll be in the shelter and you'll hear the dogs barking and jumping on the enclosures and typical things that you kind of see at animal shelters. And then we'll come back into the enclosure after we're done with our work for the day and we'll go walk through it. And it's quiet. The dogs are all laying down, relaxing or sitting near the front of their enclosures, being really sweet. There's not any barking. I think in this one video that I that I'm referencing, there's maybe like one or two barks in the background, but still amazing for an animal shelter and a much more pleasant experience for someone coming in to look to adopt a, a new friend. Awesome. Um, I've made tons of notes and I've got some questions that we kind of discussed when we caught up for a, a pre-podcast discussion last week. Um, but there was also a, a question that a member put in our Facebook group a question slash statement. Um, is, it, is it okay if I read that out to you? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like maybe it's one that um, you'll get quite a bit um, and don't mean to put you on the spot uh, where people kind of try to figure out like when this information is new to them as it is to me. Uh, and people try to figure out, like, where does this fit into my understanding of everything, my practical application of everything, uh, and also the ethical framework, whatever it is I use, and my understanding of contingencies. And, and, and as we try to, like, filter it through our mind as to, like, what are the if-thens and what are the contingencies at play here and how does this fit with my understanding of um, my my approach and what I, you know, who I identify myself to be <laughs> With regards to what tools I use, so the way the way this question was, um, and, and by the way, for those who are not in our members only Facebook group, me and Sean made a little behind the scenes video where he just introduced himself to our membership, uh, and we announced that this episode was about to happen. Um, and a member asked, "What does the human do if the dog does not have four paws on the ground?" It seems to me a shaping exercise involving positive reinforcement, as long as the dog finds affection reinforcing, and negative punishment, no withdrawal of affection for behaviours other than the target calm sitting or standing. So, in Sean Wills' words, what are your offerings on that? Yeah. So, um, you know the the. Schedule that we're using, it's not actually a schedule of reinforcement. Um, our application of affection in this instance is actually a conjugate reinforcement procedure. 
meaning that as long as all four feet are on the ground, we're petting for that. And that's our target goal. So we're not withdrawing it for anything more than anything that's not that behavior. So that petting is discontinued. What the human does is, is we just remove our hands. Anytime that the paw comes, a paw comes off the ground or they jump, or if we're dealing with a mouthy dog, as that mouth comes towards our hand, we would remove our hands and wait for that head to move away or wait for that leg to go back on the ground and continue petting them. And this conjugate reinforcement technique is is actually a really important feature of constructional affection. This is really where the learning happens and really where why it happens so quickly and why this is so important to behaviors that have these social underlying underpinnings. And there's a lot of research, if, all the, if there's people out there listening that love to dig up articles, <laughs> um, there's a lot of work done on conjugate reinforcement. And where most of it actually comes from is Ogden Lindsley. And he's got whole you know, articles on this showing how conjugate reinforcement is the ideal practice to use when we have these social underpinnings, these social relationships. And so as the dog sits, you know, engages in the behavior that we're looking for and we pet them and then we up it and pet them with two hands for sitting or lying down. So one hand for all four feet on the ground, two for sitting or laying down, the reinforcer itself intensifies as that behavior does. So when they approach and they've got all four feet on the ground, we're petting with one hand. When they sit, their behavior intensifies in this case. So, so does our reinforcement. We start petting with two hands. And when they start laying down, that's when we really start loving them up, talking to them, and it gets really, really big. And you'll see the magnitude change with the animal's behavior. And that's where they learn quickly that they've got control over the situation. And they will learn quickly how to get that reinforcement that they're looking for at this point. Um, and that's why we were able to get through these shelters that had 40, 50 dogs in them in a couple of hours and train every single one of them in there. Because the dogs, when we're working with the direct contingency that's maintaining their behavior in this fashion, they learn very quickly what to do to get these outcomes that are so important to them. And they wouldn't be doing such extreme behavior if this reinforcer wasn't so important to them. And so that conjugate schedule is a pretty awesome thing and being able to teach them how to control it. I like to think about it. Um, are, are, are you old enough to have maybe known what the, the far side cartoons are? Did you guys get those? I know, I know the hip hop group, the, the, the far side, but I don't know the cartoons. <laughs> that's, I, haven't, I haven't heard that for the music reference since the 90s. That is, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> You know the far side too? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know the cartoon. Anyway, we don't agree. Well, tell, tell us about the cartoon. The, the, the far side were these goofy, kind of crudely drawn cartoons that, that came like in the Sunday newspapers here in the States for like 30 or 40 years. I, th I think they stopped maybe in the in the mid to late 90s. And there would only be like like one picture cell, you know, would tell the whole little funny cartoon there. And like there's this one famous one where you see two aliens sitting in a UFO and they have a little green and blue splat on their windshield. And, you know, to them, it's like they've, you know, hit a bug cruising down the highway, but it's Earth, you know, but um, it's goofy little cartoons like that. And to me, I like to imagine like two dogs sitting there looking at each other and you see the human pair of legs next to them. And one of the dogs would say to the other, look what I can get my human to do. And they sit and then the human starts petting them. And so it's really about this idea of actually teaching them how to get these outcomes that are important to them. And, and yeah. Okay. So we have a four month old baby uh, and I always thought that my attention and at, at, at a time when I have no free hands and I have a big lump of human in, in my arms, um, I, I, I always thought leading up to her birth, Phoebe's going to be really challenged with this Phoebe, our uh, five-year-old chihuahua cross silky terrier. Uh, and, and because my attention is significantly decreased to her. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. sometimes I get handed a baby and there's a cat rubbing against my leg and a dog <laughs> at my other side and the, the other humans that are capable of assisting are quickly evacuated from the space because they need to go to the bathroom or something. Um, now Phoebe is quite vocal in this situation and, and very active, um, very struggling to sit still. I've tried to give her affection. After our talk last week, I was like, oh, let's just see how we go with this. Um, 
and I tried to offer her affection for calm behaviors. I don't, I haven't got myself to a place where I feel that that's what she's after is affection. So I'm, I've just like reached for the food. I'm just like, I'm just been reinforcing her for food for calm behavior. And it's kind of, it's seemingly weird, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts without any other information. <laughs> I understand <laughs> just chucking that at you. It's pretty challenging, but um, your thoughts on that based on the conversation we've had today. You know, um, affection is, um, especially just interaction in general, you know, we, we should, you know, the, the COVID times, you know, actually give a lot of testament to, you know, the power of interaction and affection from people, you know, being so isolated has shown to already have some extreme outcomes on people. Um, there's even a study done, oh crap, uh, maybe back in like the 1920s or 30s, I want to say, it was done in some European country too, I want to say where they actually got a lot of babies and they wanted to see how um, important affection and interaction was to them. And they got a bunch of babies and put them in these nurseries that didn't have a lot of stimulation. And the nurses were only instructed to go in and provide food and leave, not interact with the babies at all. And a good majority of them died. Um, So, you know, affection in and of itself is, is extremely valuable, extremely important to our development. And, you know, by all means, I would even argue that it's just as primary a reinforcer as food is. Um, You know, you, you're not going to live very long in solitary confinement. Um, We, you know, we're, we're social animals and it really shouldn't be a surprise to us either that affection is a valued reinforcer for animals that live in, you know, social structures, you know, um, wolves, bunny rabbits, you know, all sorts of things. I even, I think I told you in our private talk, I actually even done this with a turtle, which is a funny thing. You know, that's not a very social animal seemingly, (laughs) but boy, it turned out he really loved to have his shell pet. It was amazing. I, I had no idea they could actually feel their shell in that manner, but yeah, they can feel when you're petting it and they they'll react to it um but uh back to the the baby thing you know um yeah i i would absolutely say that that affection is a very critical and very important thing to your baby now one funny thing is 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 right now especially since she's a baby i'm sure that she's just getting affection all the time so probably the ability to discriminate when it is and is not occurring is probably pretty tough for her at this moment but i wouldn't encourage it anyway She's a baby, FR1, everything she does. <laughs> so with, with Phoebe running around and barking and uh, when I've got the baby and I'm I've trying to do what I would label as um, calm the baby and, and get the baby in a happy state because I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> um, mm. And Phoebe's very active and uh, using her voice a lot. Uh, in that, in those moments, I would assume that it's my divided attention that is an important antecedent for those behaviours. Um, however, affection uh, described as tactile interaction with Phoebe at that moment seemingly is not sought from the best of my observations. Um, so, w- but w- in that situation, would you be trying to <laughs> deliver attention? what one might label as a fiction in some way to Phoebe? Yeah, yeah. So in in your case, we're trying to get the dog to be calm and behave while you're holding your baby, correct? Correct. Cool. So yeah, I would go about it a couple of ways. Um, You know, I've actually done this for a few families. And um, in one case, um, most of them, I, I didn't have to slice down the behavior so small and shape it up. But um, in one case, I actually had it to where I had to get like the mom to leave with the baby. (laughs) And we had to establish some baseline behavior, you know, like in the living room before we brought the baby in. And so in this case, I I did it a lot like we would teach up a stranger greet. And um, so, you know, I would have the dog sitting next to me being calm, you know, and I'm loving her up. The person walks into the room. If she gets overexcited and starts, you know, running over there to go jump, I have the mom go back into the room and shut the door. And so then we get the dog back over, get her nice and calm, and then we love her up and have the mom shape up that behavior where she's coming towards the dog with the baby and the baby staying calm. And eventually until the mom can walk in holding the baby, love up the dog and sit on the couch. And then the dog sits at her feet and she just loves up the dog every once in a while and pays most of the attention to her baby. And so we can shape it up in the same way that we would slice down the steps, like for clicker training in this instance. And we can teach the dog 
how to actually be a part of the family in, in this example. Because what our goal here should be is teaching the dog how to hang out with the family in the living room. And so what we're probably looking for is being able to sit on the couch, everyone together, maybe watching Lord of the Rings and eating some popcorn together. And so that being the case, we want to keep our eyes on what the goal is. We just want that dog kind of hanging out at our feet or at most just calmly walking around and looking for their own spot to go lay down and get comfortable. And so those are the things that we're going to want to make sure that we're giving attention for and reinforcing. Um, We don't necessarily need to stack the criteria so high that the dog has to sit in one spot throughout this whole operation. I really don't like that because that's not really what our goal is. Like I said, it, it wouldn't be a problem if Phoebe, in your case, just went and found a nice little spot in the corner of the room and lay down while you were hanging out with your baby. Um, You just don't want her disrupting and getting barky and jumpy or doing anything that might wake the baby up or prevent her from going to sleep. And so those are the things that we can reinforce and love up with our attention. And also in these moments, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, when you have the baby, oftentimes your arms are full, right? (laughs) <laughs> and, and so it doesn't always actually have to be our physical petting that is reinforcing attention in these examples. It, it can also be, you know, just looking over and say, oh, good girl, I'm going to be over there in a minute. You're a sweet baby. And you can go sit down. You can talk to them, too. And um, one other thing that I also like to throw out there is that once when we have this behavior going, it, it's not like you have to pet it every single time it occurs. It's just that I like us to be keeping an eye out for it. That way, when we see it, we actually make sure that we're giving some kind of attention for it. Like right now, I'm actually looking down and I'm noticing that that Peepers is over here laying next to me, (laughs) just being calm down there. And so to just to keep that going a little bit, I just went down there and pet him a little bit, told me he's a good boy. (laughs) And so it doesn't have to happen every time, but as long as when we notice it, we're providing, making sure that we're giving something for it, it can really maintain that behavior and keep it going on in the future. Um, Just like with a behavior that we get shaped up with uh, clicker training. Once when we fade it out, it's not like you have to FR1 every time to keep it going. And as a matter of fact, sometimes going with a variable schedule in these points actually goes to maintain that behavior a lot better than continuous reinforcement would anyhow. And you say that this is something that works for, uh, was it a tortoise or a turtle? Tortoise. Do I? You, you said before that you worked... You did construction or fiction with a tortoise or a turtle? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, this was a tortoise. A tortoise, yeah. A tortoise, yeah. Uh, you, you reference wolves and bunny rabbits who are, uh, have affection as a primary enforcer. Uh, so seemingly all earthlings could benefit from some kind of affection, including humans. So how has construction or fiction been or not been used with humans? Um, uh, probably never deliberately, (laughs) but, uh, absolutely, you know, um, our our affection, you know, maintains behaviors, you know, uh, you know, and, and not only our friends, but, you know, our partners, um, all of our relationships and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't probably recommend going and petting your friends, <laughs> but, um, you know, this actually brings me to a, to a really good point too. And, um, You you know, I I oftentimes like to talk about the philosophy of constructional affection, and and this kind of really is more just the philosophy of the constructional approach. And um, in in case any of your listeners maybe haven't heard that 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 name before, the constructional approach is a approach developed by Dr. Israel Goldiman. He was a professor at the University of Chicago and uh, did some amazing work with people. They, they have some amazing, you know, outcomes published with stuttering, overeating, um, you know, people in psychiatric centers, all, all sorts of different kinds of uh, situations. And it was that that Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz picked up on and started applying to animals when he developed the constructional aggression treatment and also taught it to Kelly Snyder, who, you know, systematized that and made that into her thesis. Um, She's an awesome guest to have on if you haven't had her before either. Kelly's a totally cool person and an amazing behavior analyst. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the philosophy is one where we are making sure that we're, we're building repertoires. 
And, and so, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, our daily interactions with our dogs and how we're giving affection, I like to stress that we should always kind of be thinking about that. You know, what is it that we are building in our dog? You know, when I'm giving affection to them, a good question to ask is, is this a really good time to do it? Is this the kind of dog that I want to make sure that I'm seeing in the future? Because as we start to allocate our attention to these good things, it's a lot like dropping a pebble in a pond and you're going to start creating ripples. And in this case, this is going to be endless ripples of new possibilities of amazing interactions and an amazing relationship that we've always desired to have. You know, you're going to see their behavior change from being calm in this one instance to being calm when your friend now comes over. You're going to see them try and sit and be calm for that person. And you're going to see them exploring and trying this new behavior in new places. And before you know it, that that one dog that you used to call hyperactive and uncontrollable and untrainable is now that sweet, amazing, calm dog who behaves like this all the time. And that's the case for Peepers. Um, Peepers, actually, when I got, you know, because I even had another dog when I got Peepers. So I had to do construction aggression treatment between myself and Peepers and then between my dog and Peepers. And then we did constructional affection. But Peepers was definitely what you might call hyperactive when I got him. He literally ate through the middle of one of my sofas, it ripped open the top cushion, went through the bottom of it. Like it was like he was going to go to China, you know, right through my couch. <laughs> He's going to come visit you. He knew you were hanging out down there in New Zealand. <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, as I started to do constructional affection and peepers too was where my interest got peaked in separation anxiety. He would rip up my whole house, the carpet, the window seals. He ate an iPhone, shoes, um, a PlayStation controller. He destroyed just about everything in my house when I would leave. And if I tried to put him in an enclosure, he would go in just fine. But when I would come back home, he will have been barking inside his enclosure for so long that there would be saliva dried on the bars of the enclosure. And the bottom of it, the plastic bottom, or you know, even if it had his bed, it would all be soaking wet inside there. And even the carpet around the enclosure would be wet from him just barking that whole time that I was gone. Very unhealthy for him. You know, that must have been the worst experiences he probably ever knew, even, you know, his beginning of his life living in the wild. And so, you know, I directly started doing constructional affection with him and trying to teach him how to behave when I left. And like I said, you know, I started to see these behaviors spread to different situations where eventually it just kind of became who Peepers was or who Peepers is. He's just now a calm dog. And that's the really amazing thing that that, you know, we can really get to when we take this kind of a constructional approach to our animals is it allows us to actually see these behaviors for what they are. You know, no matter how crazy or destructive or damaging it may seem for the animal, these are all behaviors that actually serve a very specific function. And uh, Jesus used to always have this great saying, too, that, you know, behaviors that seem seemingly like come out of the blue are the ones that are having the most important consequences because they are tied to a very specific instance where that behavior is very, that reinforcer is very valuable for them. And so it allows us to start seeing these behaviors as these things that have these outcomes. And when we can accept that, we can then start investigating for what those outcomes are. What is the setting that makes these outcomes valuable? What are they? And how can we deliver these outcomes to our animals for appropriate behavior that would be easier and more acceptable for both of us? And that to me is where we truly get to that point where we can really start to help our animal companions live a really high quality of life. And this is, um, you know, our podcast that Masa and I put on. It's the constructional approach to animal welfare and training. And that is really the big thing that we like to focus on in that podcast is how taking a constructional approach to our animals' lifestyles and our interactions with them actually helps to guarantee a high quality of life for them. And you said in just that last a little offering there, when we can accept that, do you, do you find that people are, have challenges accepting some of the stuff you've been talking about? Sometimes we, um, I, I wouldn't say that people do. Um, I would say that sometimes um, when we um, when we have certain procedures and tools, and this is really something that happens in every field, um, this is something that's not new to behavior analysis. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe Dr. Sigrid Glenn was uh, giving a talk on this at ABAI this year. Um, sometimes we end up using procedures that 
are so incredibly effective that we sometimes get a little bit too attached to these procedures and start just kind of always applying it, almost like it's a cookie cutter procedure fit for every situation. And so I like to just make sure that we have a a good system to look at what's going on and determine what tool it is that we do need to use. Because inevitably, um, constructional aggression treatment, you know, constructional affection, clicker training, all these different training approaches out there, they all serve their purpose and all have their utility. The important thing is that we learn how to recognize the situations when they're effective. And I like to make sure when I'm doing it that I'm matching up contingencies, so to speak. I like to make sure that we're using the reinforcer that is maintaining that problem behavior. We want to make sure that we're delivering that for our desired behaviors. But we also want to make sure that in the middle of this, that we, um, oh my gosh, I think I just lost my train of thought. (laughs) Um, In the middle of this, we're matching up contingencies. (laughs) Um, Oh yeah, that's right. I, I, I also like to make sure that the contingencies are lining up so that we're not trying to use a positive reinforcement contingency when it's a negative reinforcement situation. So, for example, it's not a really good idea to give food to an aggressive dog. And and my reasoning for that, I touched on it a little bit earlier. We're not actually dealing with the contingency that's at hand. We're not actually dealing with the problem when we do that. Ken Ramirez actually gave a really good presentation years and years ago at a um, Art and Science of Animal Training conference where he compared uh, desensitization, counterconditioning, um, flooding, and uh, constructional aggression treatment. He compared all of the procedures and their outcomes. And what he concluded at the end of this presentation was that the only, one, the only treatment that actually got to the root of the aggression and dealt with it was the constructional aggression treatment. And it's because it is using the negative reinforcement contingency that's maintaining that problem behavior to shape up this other behavior. And in these other situations, if we're using desensitization, for example, we're actually coming close. And then whenever that dog calms down, we actually get closer or we provide food and we get closer. And in these instances, we're actually punishing calm behavior. So if I walk forward to you and you are calm and I don't leave, I've not reinforced the calm behavior. If I come closer and you get calm and then I get closer again, I've punished it. And so it's going to set up a situation where that aggression is likely never going to be going away, especially if we're actually trying to add in a food treat in this situation. Because like I said earlier, when that aversive thing is more aversive than that food is valuable, you can bet that that aggressive behavior is going to return. And it's because we've never actually taught the dog what to do in those moments, which is what Cat is so amazing at. Well, I would like to pretend that at the end of this podcast episode, I could go now and apply all of this, but I definitely know the more I learn, the less I know. Uh, So I've got a lot to go away and explore and and think about uh, and apply. Um, So I'm grateful for everything you've shared today. We are now, uh, because of time, going to head towards the the final question for this episode. I know there were some bullet points that we didn't quite get to today, but that's okay. People that are interested can uh, explore the resources and go to the links that we'll provide in the show notes. Uh, Sean, we went back to your start with uh, your dog chewing up your dresser and leaving water all over the floor when you woke up in the morning. We've had dogs trying to dig down to me here in New Zealand. Obviously, there's a huge reinforcer if they get here because I'm here. Um, but now I'd like you to look into the future for us. What does is, what is Sean Will want to see happen in our uh, behavior, analytical, animal training, dog training uh, world over the next five to ten years? Well, um, I would really like to see the continued growth that we're already seeing. Um, something I didn't get to talk about today. There, well, actually, there's a whole lot we didn't get to talk about today. I have a tendency to fly off, you know, but... um. You know, uh, Alexandra Curlin and Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz, they're talking a lot right now about truly positive training. And at the root of it is really what we've been talking about today. It's about making sure that we're not accidentally restricting behavior by virtue of our procedures. And sometimes our positive reinforcement procedures can have a tendency to do that, especially if the reinforcers are not in line. 
And so, you know, touching back on that last example I was just talking about with aggression, you know, when we're providing food for alternate behavior, it's actually, it can be seen or argued to be more restrictive than a constructional aggression, aggression treatment procedure, which is using negative reinforcement. And it's because what the dog is actually wanting is distance. So when we're trying to give them food, we're actually restricting them access to what it is that they're really wanting, which is distance from this aversive thing. And so I like the, that now we are starting to consider how the contingency isn't really just set by us. Just because we are implementing a positive reinforcement procedure doesn't mean that it's actually a positive thing for the dog. And so I love that we are looking at this now and we're starting to have this discussion and see how we can actually make sure that we're implementing procedures that have the kind of desired outcome that we're all looking for with our animals, which is an amazing, fun learning experience that enhances our relationships. And my last point I'd like to make on this is, is where I really like to see constructional affection become more useful for people. I think that establishing that calm behavior is a very important thing for before we go on walks, when we're going into veterinary offices, before going into potentially stressful situations, it can even help to get our animals calm before doing it. And this is the one thing that I think has really been helpful for me when working with my dogs when I'm doing clicker training is I actually get them, I do the interaction guidelines with them to get them calm in the environment before I begin my clicker training. That way I already have my dog kind of sitting there calm, paying attention to me and ready to start learning and doing fun things. And when we do that, I think that only like super turbocharges our relationship with our companions because now they not only see you as the source of all this love and wonderful attention, but now, holy cow, you're giving me food too that I love. You know, I think to me that really kind of just sets overload, you know, for the dog for awesome time and great relationship and amazing trust building while we're going through this together. Well, I know what I want to learn more, and you mentioned you've got a podcast show earlier, uh, so that's one location potentially where listeners of this show can go to learn more and engage and be a not a participant, but <laughs> be a part of conversations that are happening about constructional approach. Sean, can you direct the listeners of this show where they can go to find the podcast and where they can go to find more information about the things that you've talked about today and get in touch with you? Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, yeah, I've got a website. It's uh, constructionalaffection.com. That's where you can see information specifically towards the procedure for constructional affection. There's a lot of good videos there on how to do the interaction guidelines and different applications of the affection loop. But uh, there's also a podcast that myself and Masa host. It's the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training. And this is on Apple Podcasts. You can find it on Spotify, BuzzFeed. I believe it's on the Google Podcasts as well. And um, other than that, uh, we've got a Facebook group too. It's the Constructional Approach to Animal Welfare and Training. And that's where you can stay up to date on different conferences that we're doing, workshops and webinars and other fun things like that. Wonderful. And we will, of course, link to all of us in the show notes as well. Sean, I knew this was going to be an easy episode for me because, as you said, you kind of go off on tangents. So we call that passion talking. That's not a Ryan phrase, everyone. That's a Theresa McEwen phrase, and we're grateful to that credit to her. Um, so you are pretty good at passion talking, Sean. We're grateful for that. <laughs> so from myself and on behalf of everyone listening today, we appreciate your passion talking and for you taking the time to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy today. It's really appreciated. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's really awesome to be a part of this great community. I've had a great time checking out all of the stuff on the Facebook page and seeing everyone's comments. So I'm, I'm, an, I'm honored to be here. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. 
Thanks again so much, everyone, for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.